Welcome back everyone, my name is Nimble Thor, and today we are playing Raid Shadow of Legends, which is a new game by Plarium, it's out on iOS, and in a beta version on Android. So this game is a new turn-based hero collector RPG, and you know, that can mean one of either two things, so either the game is paid to win garbage, and you shouldn't play it, or it's amazing, but probably still pay to win, at least... I have yet to find a turn-based hero collector RPG with no pay-to-win elements whatsoever. But today we're gonna have a closer look at what Raid Shadow of Legends has to offer. So already, you guys can see we had the auto system on, because yes, of course, as with any RPG hero collector, there is an auto system. It's really bad though, so I wouldn't recommend using it, but it's there if you guys like that. First of all, the game looks great. Look at this, the graphics are amazing. You guys might have seen the menu before, that looks fantastic as well. It does also take up 1.2 gigabyte of space though, so as always, crisp graphics like these and, and an amazing voiceover and so on, it does come at a price in terms of taking up a lot of space on your on your smartphone. But as for the content in this game, there's lots and lots of it. Lots of PvE content in particular, such as, for example, the normal campaign missions that we're playing right now, and then a story that slowly unfolds as well, and there are boss fights, boss battles, there are raids, guild raids as well. Uh, so there's really a lot to get into in this game, and there are even some events that you can only play on certain days throughout the week. So really a lot of PvE content. And then of course there's the arena, where we can fight against other players' defensive setups, and they fight against ours. Not really that interesting, but at least the less competitive the game is, the less the pay-to-win aspects will impact the gameplay as well. So actually, in these types of games, I prefer that the PvP aspect is kind of toned down, toned down a tiny bit. So if we look at the actual combat here, we are now at the last fight of this level here, but we're gonna go continue to the next one, because the combat is actually decently interesting, but I do feel that many of the skills feel almost the same across the different types of heroes. So if we look at this one, for example, we have three different abilities. One is our normal attack, and then we have one here that attacks one enemy, then all of the enemies, and then we have another one over here that attacks all enemies twice. So let's use that one, for example, and let's just use it here in the middle, doesn't really matter. It's gonna attack all of them. And there you go. Okay, so we're on to the next hero now. This one only has two abilities, the normal one, and then this one that attacks one enemy with one random ally. So, of course, that's somewhat unique, I guess, but then when we move on to the next heroes, you guys will see that many of them have this sort of setup where, well, you're gonna attack one hero twice, or you're gonna attack all of the all of the opponent heroes. For example, this one here, right? Attacks all enemies twice, and then, yes, of course, this one has a 10% chance of placing a 15% decrease in speed debuff for one turn, but still, many of the skills feel almost the same, at least here in the early game. Luckily though, there's just a ton of different heroes to unlock, which does keep the game interesting, but eventually I feel like you'll probably run out of interesting skills to use and you may be enticed to start using the auto system uh, at that point. Unless, of course, you constantly go in and unlock new heroes, and you definitely want to do that, but eventually in these hero collectors, you do find your, you know, your main set of heroes that you somewhat want to stick with because they're good and they're the ones that has the best equipment, you've upgraded them the most, uh, and so on. Because you can upgrade literally everything in this game. Like, everything. You know, all the, all the heroes can be upgraded, all of your equipment can be upgraded, all of it can be enhanced, upgraded, leveled up. Uh, and so on. And I'm gonna show you guys that as soon as we're done with this fight here. We're in round two out of three. All of these battles consist of three rounds, uh, typical turn-based RPG style. So these fights do become pretty repetitive as well, which is another reason that you might just eventually want to get into the auto system, because also with the auto system on, it is actually a bit faster, and of course you can do other things. Meanwhile, you can, you know, sit at your computer, you can even, you, you know, you can do homework, you can actually be working while playing this game. I don't really like that, but, uh, but some of you guys might like it. My main complaint with the upgrading system that we're gonna go back and have a look at right now is that it costs in-game currency to equip new armor because then we have to unequip the existing armor. So let's go in here, for example, and say we want to switch out something on, uh, let's say on this one, for example, we can at least equip a new helmet, it seems. Let's do that. This one has an HP increase, so let's equip that. But let's say we now want to equip, for example, what could it be? Let's say we want to equip this sword instead of the one we have on us already, so we click equip. And as you guys can see, it actually costs 20,000 in-game currency to unequip the existing equipment we have on us. I don't like that. That, that's a horrible system. Why? It feels so punishing. I like in my RPGs to be able to have the complete freedom to equip whatever I want to equip whenever I want to without feeling that I'm being punished somehow. But look at this. The models look amazing in this game. We can just have a look at some of our heroes here. All of them look really great and there's so much interesting armor that you can equip uh, and, and they do impact your character's strength 
quite a lot. So you definitely want to go in there and equip as much of it as possible. Look at this guy. Isn't he badass? And then going into the tavern, as I mentioned to you guys, we can upgrade every single aspect of these guys. So we can upgrade this hero, for example, by sacrificing other heroes or by drinking some beer, it seems. But for example, we could choose to sacrifice this one, which I'm not really sure I want to do because it seems to be a rare one. But you get the point. You can do that. You can sacrifice your other heroes. You can also upgrade them. You can upgrade skills of your heroes. And then eventually you'll be able to ascend your heroes as well. So yes, there is a ton of content in this game and there's also a clan system, for example, apart from all the quests and missions that we can also complete. And you definitely want to join a clan as early on as possible because then you can go into these clan boss fights. They're super challenging. Many of these boss fights and dungeons are really challenging, but that's what makes the game fun as well. So definitely do that as soon as you can. The auto combat system is there, but it's not super useful, which is fine by me because I don't really like auto systems. But probably most importantly, with the way this game pushes its inner purchases, its energy system, and the relentless upgrading, this isn't the best turn-based RPG out there, but there aren't that many high-quality, in terms of the graphic, fantasy turn-based hero collectors out there. So if you're in the market for this type of game, if you enjoy this genre, then this game might still be worth checking out for you, regardless of the rather insane pay-to-win, I would say. There's really a lot of it, and uh, these inner purchases are pushed quite heavily. Whenever you log in, you get asked to buy some of these inner purchases, costing up to, you know, 10 US dollars, 20 US dollars, 30 US dollars, going all the way up to 100 US dollars. But what do you guys think about this game? Let me know in the comment section down below. Could you see yourself playing it or would you never play a game like this? Let's discuss that in the comment section. And now it's time for the mobile gaming news of the day. And today's mobile gaming news is about Singa. Yes, Singa. That's a name I haven't heard in a while. But apparently their mobile revenue increased by 12% this year to $228 million in total. And it seems like they're making an actual comeback with games like, for example, Merge Dragons that I actually covered here on the channel a very long time ago at this point. So hey, maybe we will start seeing more Singa games on mobile again soon. Is that a good thing? Well, that's rather subjective. I have never really liked their games, but Merge Dragon was pretty fun. So if they decide to make more of those types of games, you know what? I'm all for it in that case. But guys, that was it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did. You should subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. If you're new around here, I cover a new mobile game every single day. So there's lots of content to dive into. And you can go back and look at the huge back catalog of games we have already played if you're new around here. With that said, until next time, just keep gaming, stay awesome, and I'll see you guys around.